afternoon, folks, and welcome to another one of our virtual tours of outer space. My name is Josh. It is my privilege to be able to broadcast to you from my own home. We are sending out to you through the Morrison Planetarium Facebook page, and our friends over at Open Space have been kind enough to let us use their YouTube channel as well. So thank you for tuning in, all 44 of you so far. It is a great opportunity for us to really see, kind of see, interact with our audience in a uh, otherwise kind of trying time. So we're going to be doing our virtual tour of outer space, which is a show that, well, basically you folks are writing. You tell me where to go. I'm just the bus driver. I'm going to take you wherever you feel like visiting on our scenic tour of our solar system and beyond. And I asked a couple folks where they think we are now. So if there's a spot in your solar system you think we should be visiting instead of this one, sounds like happy-go-lucky thinks we are on the moon. I 100% sympathize. When I was first introduced to high-resolution images of this object, I said, well, okay, but we already have photos of the moon. So why do we need photos of Mercury? Now, Mercury and the moon do look super similar. I would wholeheartedly agree. If you wanted to delineate them, kind of the best way to do it is to look at them from a great distance away. So we are seeing this planet of our solar system, smallest planet we've got in our solar system, rendered out in the open space software. But this isn't just like an artist's depiction or someone's idea of what the surface of Mercury should look like. Open space is actually a NASA product. It's using actual photographic images taken of the worlds of our solar system stitched together beautifully to allow us to do cool stuff like this. Now, when we are looking at the surface of Mercury up close, once in a while, you can pick out an interesting photographic artifact, something like this, where two photos that were taken at different times are matching up. But check this out. How cool is this? One of them was taken when the sun was over here. So the back wall of the crater is lit up. The fore wall is dark. Over here, you can see the back wall is dark. The fore wall is lit up. So the illumination of the surface changes depending on where the source of light is. And where is that source of light? That is, of course, our sun. So this is a free open source software, one that you can download for yourself and use at home. So if you think I'm doing a bad job piloting and you think you could do better, by all means do so. Download it, check it out, impress your friends and family. It is a really fun way to explore our solar system and beyond. Okay. So when we're talking about our sun, it really does dominate our solar system. When we think about the energy provided to us here on planet Earth, that's from a good distance away. Now, have you ever gone camping and stood next to the campfire, maybe stood a little too close to the campfire? You can feel that radiant heat from the campfire on your face. It's not hot air blowing off. That would be if you hold your face over the campfire. But that radiant heat is the light energy shining off of it and bonking into your cells. So our bodies feel that heat. Think about what's going on with the sun. When you walk outside on a nice, hot, bright day, you can feel that energy from the sun bonking into you. But this is 93 million miles away, making it the closest star to us. But Tanya wants to know, what is the closest star to us other than the sun? Excellent qualifier. You've defeated my normal joke of saying the sun. But the closest star to us is one called Proxima Centauri. There's two little tiny brown dwarfs that are a near miss. They are almost about the same distance away as the entire Centauri system, but they are slightly farther away, if I recall. Proxima Centauri is still the reigning champ for closest distance to our sun. And if we want to see Proxima Centauri, I have bad news. We'd have to turn on our brown dwarf indicators because Proxima Centauri itself is so faint. How faint is it? It is so faint that we wouldn't actually see it in our map of stars, but we can pick out the rest of its companions. The closest stars to our sun, I would hazard a guess, are this system right there. To our eyeballs, it's only going to look like one. Uh, oh, nope, I'm going to recant that. I would bet that our closest star is right there, and that's Proxima Centauri. So when we look at Proxima Centauri, we are seeing something that is four light years away, thereabouts. And that is more than one parsec. Parsec is 3.27 light years, if I recall. But it moves so little in the sky, it's almost imperceptible. Nonetheless, it is the closest star system to our sun and is actually made of multiple stars, at least three, one of them being the very faint, very red Proxima Centauri. Actually, that right there must be, I'm double checking, yep, that is Sirius, the dog star. So that's about nine light years away. So that little faint one I indicated earlier, that must have been Centaurus. 
or Alpha Centauri, right there. There we go. It's important to pay attention to what your background constellations are. If you're going to fly around for your folks, don't make the same mistakes I do. Okay, so diving back into our own solar system, we can see the orbits of the planets around our sun. Let's see, I saw a whole bunch of planetary questions pop up earlier. Let's see, we wanted to see some Kuiper Belt Oort Cloud. The Oort Cloud, let me double check. I can actually pull this up and show you on yours how you would activate it. But I think in my version, I have that turned off. But let's check out our solar system. Let's check out things orbiting the sun. Now, I can show you where our bands would be, but I don't think I have the Kuiper belt loaded. So my apologies, but let's check out where our belts would be. If you wanna see Ceres, it's actually right there in pale blue, halfway between Mars and Jupiter, there's kind of an empty gap. An astronomer named Bode, B-O-D-E, although the O might be an unusual O, uh, discovered that the distances of the planets were mm, kind of had a relationship. The, the farther out ones were usually at about twice the distance of the near in ones. And he extrapolated from that little bit of data and guessed that there was a hidden mysterious planet halfway between Mars and Jupiter. Turns out it's not a planet. It's a dwarf planet and a very small dwarf planet. Now, I would argue the classification of planet versus dwarf planet, but according to the IAU, this is something else entirely. It is the world Ceres. But Ceres is big compared to the other things in the asteroid belt. Turns out it's about almost half of the mass of the asteroid belt all by itself. So there's a bunch of other little particles flying around at about that distance from the sun. If we go all the way out here, you can see Pluto is not in the asteroid belt, but it is in the Kuiper belt, kind of a similar analogous structure just past the orbit of Neptune, although some of them are actually closer to the sun than Neptune. Those are the trans-Neptunian objects. Sounds like a really cool band name. Okay, let's see. I see some requests for a black hole. Quite a few folks are on the black hole train. I wholeheartedly agree. Turns out seeing a black hole is always a challenging thing to do, quite simply because they hold on to light. When we talk about simulations of a black hole, often you're seeing something called the event horizon or a kind of orbiting disk of light wrapped around the black hole that could still be imaged by us, but that's not very bright. So at a great distance, and most black holes we think are very far away from our own sun, certainly not within our own solar system, we would be talking about something very, very far away and very faint. But we can see our stars. It turns out, as a matter of fact, our entire galaxy is made of stars, and we really should be seeing our galaxy by this point. So, hmm, I'm going to crank us back and see if I just missed it. Nope. Turns out our galaxy didn't load. That's most mysterious. But we can still show you about where in our galaxy this thing should be. For our supermassive black hole, we really want to be checking out the center of our own Milky Way. So to find the Milky Way, all you got to do is look for this bright streak. That is the Milky Way itself but not all parts of the Milky Way are equal. When you look over here, you can see a lot of bright stuff and dark stuff very closely intermixed. That tells us we are looking at the southern sky part of the Milky Way. Our own northern sky part is a little bit more homogenous, a little bit more smeared out. You can see that over here with this long, dark patch. Right in between, we have the center of the Milky Way. How do I know this is the center? It's the thickest part around. Also, if you were to count stars in every single direction, you would see more stars in the center towards this direction than any other. And how does that help us? Well, imagine you appeared in a forest and you looked in every direction around you. And in one direction, you saw a lot of trees and the other direction you saw fewer. The center of the forest would more likely be in the direction of more trees. If you look away from the center, you're likely to see fewer trees, and that tells you you're looking away from the center. That gave us our first guess about where the mass of stars in the Milky Way was, but way down there in the very center of our galaxy is a supermassive black hole called Sagittarius A star. So while I'm having a hard time showing you the galaxy itself, you can look up some of the photos of a similar black hole in another galaxy. That's the Event Horizon Telescope's image of a black hole, and it is about as classy as we're gonna get for an actual image of a black hole. Okay, I saw a request for Galilean moons. That one I am 90% sure I can fulfill. 
So let's go check out our Galilean moon orbits. So when we talk about the Galilean moons, these are not moons that Galileo visited. No human being has gone beyond the orbit of the moon. Well, slightly beyond the orbit of the moon for our Apollo missions when they're on the far side. But when we talk about the Galilean moons, they were not an object or a set of objects known to the ancient astronomers, which means that they were, in fact, at one point, discovered. The real question here is, when were they discovered? Imperial Chinese astronomers actually have what might be an observation of at least two of the moons dating back of almost a thousand years before Galileo. But in the Western canon of astronomy, their discovery is attributed to Galileo Galilei and his telescope. By pointing a telescope at Jupiter and recording what he saw, he was able to prove that some of these little tiny bright objects, which he thought might be stars, actually traveled around Jupiter. Now, at that point in astronomy, we were still kind of hammering out what's the whole planet versus star versus uh, Earth versus other celestial objects. And thank goodness we have all that sorted out and don't have to ask that question anymore. But when we're talking about these celestial objects, we now call them moons. The moons could not be more dissimilar. They are all large moons. They are all orbiting Jupiter. And there the similarities end. I guess they're all round, too. Io is a very volcanically active world. While it might have sort of an icy crust on the surface, the surface is by and large rock. The rock is very active, being squeezed, squeezed, that's the word, by Jupiter. Energy is imparted into its surface and powering that incredible amount of volcanic activity. Out beyond Io, we have Europa. Europa looks very different because Europa is very different. It turns out Europa is an ice-covered world. So while it does have a solid outer layer like Io, instead of being rock, this is largely icy. Uh, we have a wonderful discussion with a specialist on the features that give Europa these distinctive cracks and fissures. A lot of them are actually being sort of inscribed by that gravitational interaction with Jupiter. It's hard to overstate just how much Jupiter influences the Jovian system. It is the big boss, the thing that kind of controls the orbits and actions of all the other worlds that surround it. So Europa has this icy cracked riddled surface. Underneath that ice, we have potentially a huge ocean of liquid water. It's one of the most exciting finds in astronomy in my lifetime in our own solar system that there are massive subsurface oceans inside Europa. Now, that's pretty cool. Yeah, so Tanya wants to know icy like water. On our planet, we have a solid rocky crust, which melts and turns into a liquid rocky crust underneath. On Europa, we have a solid icy crust, which gives way to a liquid icy crust which is what we humans like to call water. So we think salt water, and we think about twice as much salt water as we have on Earth, which is just mind boggling. But there are more than two Galilean moons, and I can't get too distracted on Europa because I'm gonna name it Europa is my favorite moon this week, and I could spend a long time talking about it. So we're gonna jet us out to our next moon, and that is gonna be Ganymede. Now Ganymede is the only one of the four Galilean moons named for a gentleman. You can look down at the surface. This is actually distinguished by being the other largest moon in our solar system. Terry wants to know, what is the biggest moon? Boom, you are looking at it, Terry. This is the biggest moon around. Ganymede is bigger than Mercury. Remember where we started? Smallest planet in our solar system? Biggest moon is actually larger than smallest planet. This is a gem. Now you can see these light parts, dark parts, and then the extra light parts are actually impact sites. Where Io and Europa had sort of a volcano-y or an icy surface, this one is a little bit more rocky, even though there's probably a great constituent of ice in the outer mixture, but it's an ancient surface. It is old. You can see a lot of cracks and impact sites, which tell us that it has endured a lot of impacts, which means it hasn't changed a lot over time. So this is a much older surface than Io or Europa, but it does have hints that it was active at some point you got these huge color changes between the light parts and the dark parts, maybe evidence of flows or movement or activity in the ancient past. And just for fun, I'm gonna take us to our very last of our Galilean moons. So to do that, we're gonna to go to our planets menu, we're gonna to go to our Jupiter menu, we're gonna to go to our moons menu, and we are going to go visit Callisto. Now Callisto is the piece that completes the puzzle. I said Io and Europa were active, Ganymede was inactive, but has activity in its ancient past. Callisto is really ancient. We don't even think it was active a long time ago. This is a cold, hard surface that bears thousands and thousands and thousands of impact scars. So 
every single one of our Galilean moons is unique in its own special way. We can learn about a record of past and a massive Galilean moon in uh, Ganymede. Callisto is our ancient and scarred moon telling us about the solar system's past long, long ago. We have our icy moon in Europa and our active volcanoes on Io. It is a wonderful system and really can teach us an awful lot about the diversity of the objects we call moons. But I don't want it to be this just the moon show. So let's see if we have another suggestion. Leon wanted to know, have we found life? Excellent question, Leon. We actually are looking in our own solar system for life on places like Europa and the icy moon Enceladus surrounding Saturn. We also have Titan is an atmosphere covered moon around Saturn, but it's very, very cold. When we're talking about life, we have to look for life that does not survive in habitable conditions. When we say habitable, that's kind of a loaded question. That means conditions that life on Earth would find comfortable. But maybe aliens are a lot tougher than life on Earth. Maybe they don't need conditions like our own. So what we're really stuck trying to understand is where could life exist? What form would that like take? And do those conditions exist in the universe around us? So let's break that down a little bit. When we talk about where could life exist, we are often biased by saying, where do we know there is life, which is Earth. It is only Earth. Earth is the only planet where we know life exists. And all life here needs water. It needs moderate temperatures. It needs a chemically not super horrible environment. There's a lot of things that life on Earth requires. We're sort of needy that way. But when we talk about some life on Earth, it's a lot tougher than you or me. We've got life forms that can survive inside hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean, life that can survive in water so salty it should kill pretty much anything else. We can have life forms like tardigrades that can endure traumatic changes that almost no other life form could. Life on Earth is tough and diverse. So then maybe life could exist anywhere in the solar system. Well, looking at the other planets nearby, we haven't seen much evidence of life. So maybe life needs a lot of space. Maybe life needs just the right combination of elements and is unlikely. So when we're starting to look, we're deciding that maybe we need to look for a place like Earth. Well, congratulations. Camaro Mike has the right idea. There's actually a planet very close to us that looks just like Earth. That's Mars. If you want to hear more about this, I'm going to touch on this, but you should really come back Friday because we are going to have an expert in Mars and Earth analogs doing our cosmic conversations. So make sure you tune into that. When we look at Mars, this is a planet so similar to our own in so many ways that if life was common and could form pretty much anywhere, life probably should have at least started at some point on Mars. Mars itself has billions of years of history, just like planet Earth, and over that time has changed a fair amount. So maybe there is life there, hiding under a rock or inside a cave. That's one of the objectives for the Perseverance mission, is to help us examine some of these life-likely spots and better understand what's going on. And that is coming up. So we wanted to find life outside of our solar system, someplace else. We would really need to tune into our exoplanets. Now, TESS is currently looking for an exoplanet that is really nearby and has characteristics similar to our own planet. That's going to be a really cool thing to check out. I would love to find out what the nearest Earth-like planet is so we can maybe get a chance to see what's going on chemically there and see if there's an opportunity for life. I think it would be wonderful for us to discover life in our lifetimes. Ah, that's kind of a joke. But it hasn't happened yet. A lot of people have a lot of money riding on the fact that it might happen soon. But for me, I am content to continue to observe. Bertha wants to know, can we show Jezero Crater? I don't want to spoil the surprise for Friday. We have really cool photos of Jezero Crater. So if you are able to tune in Friday, make sure you do so. If you're not able to tune in Friday, make sure you watch that repeat show. It's going to be recorded. It'll be up on our website. And it should be up on Open Space. And there will be an awesome opportunity for you to see Jezero Crater and hear from somebody who really knows what they're talking about as she's doing her academic work on Jezero and other similar sites. Okay, I wanted to show off our exoplanets just because I think it's really cool. We have not found a perfect match for Earth yet, but we have found an awful lot of exoplanets. All these purple circles I accidentally sent away ah, are where we know there are exoplanets. Now, when you see a purple circle, that does not mean that there's only one exoplanet there. Often, it means that there is more than one. 
So this is a beginning, a preliminary understanding of how many worlds there could be in the galaxy around us. And it seems like the universe is rotten with planets. They're just about everywhere. But here's a fun thought, given what we've covered so far. If I were to ask you how many planets in our solar system could support life, the answer, I think, conservatively, would be maybe one. Well, we know one. Maybe two. Now, that would be Earth and Mars. We know Jupiter can't support life. We know Saturn can't support life, as we know it. Uranus and Neptune are far cries as well. Venus is absolutely horrible. And the surface of Mercury is just a barren rock. So maybe Earth, maybe Mars. Some people might throw Venus back in that ring, at least for the upper cloud layer. But then you, with even a very liberal guess, you'd have three worlds that could support life. Well, I'm going to change that word from planets, how many planets could support life, to really worlds, including moons. And all of a sudden, you've got places like Europa, Enceladus, Saturn, a lot more options pop out. So when you look at all these blue circles, that's how many places we have discovered with at least one planet. Maybe two planets, maybe four planets, maybe in some cases five, six, seven planets. But how many moons have we found around those systems? Diddly squat. We have not found a single moon around a planet that does not exist in our solar system. So if you start thinking about how many of those solar systems might have maybe Galilean style moons, we found a lot of Jupiters, there's probably a lot of Galilean moons out there, then the number of potentially habitable worlds only creeps up. There's a lot of different ideas you can plug in to increase those numbers. Dial them forward, dial them back. If you want to really understand how we perform some of these calculations, check out something called the Drake Equation. The Drake Equation is a tool that SETI uses to help understand the likelihood that we might be able to communicate with a radio intelligent civilization sometime in the future. Some people say the Drake number is very high. I think there's a lot of evidence to support that. But then people might counter with, well, why haven't we heard from anybody yet? Which is a depressing question. Other people say the Drake number might be very low. And if that's true, well, then why are we finding so many planets with seemingly good environments for some kind of life to exist, even though we haven't found more life yet? All in all, I would love to offer you a truly satisfying question, but I don't think there necessarily is one yet. Until we find life somewhere else in the universe looking back at us, I think we here on planet Earth have a pretty big responsibility to keep looking out and observing just how beautiful and wonderful our universe is. But in that spirit, looking down at planet Earth, I want to see if there's any last spots we could maybe go check out before we take off. Sounds like folks want to see Pluto. Dianis, we can definitely make that happen. Let's go check out Pluto. So on our trip to Pluto, we could take the New Horizons route. At New Horizons speed, it's going to take about 10 years to get there, but I think that would make me run over my 5 o'clock cutoff. So instead, we are taking the extra special express route, which sometimes means I crash into Pluto. But this time I didn't. Looking down at Pluto, you can see an amalgam. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of things going on here, so let's see if we can unpack a little bit of this action. Over here, it looks like Pluto has fallen into shadow, but I want to assure you it has not. What we are seeing is a dark surface. The albedo, the amount of light reflected by Pluto, goes down over here. Why does it do that? We're not really sure. It does. When you look over here, you can see that it's sort of dramatically changed, kind of like along a clean line. All of a sudden, it's getting lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. And that means more light is bouncing, almost like a white snow field. It turns out a lot of Pluto is ice. So this is probably highly reflective ice. And this might be highly reflective ice with some kind of compound, maybe dark sand or soot smeared across the surface. As we go farther and farther away from the dark region, you can start to see this very, very light region. Over here, this looks like fresh, new, fallen snow. And over here, you might actually be able to see some features kind of like that. There's an unusually smooth part here that maybe indicates a more recent surface change. It turns out, a lot like our moons of Jupiter, you can tell how old a surface is by looking at how many impact sites are on it. So over here, we saw lots and lots of impact sites in the darker region. Over here, you can see this kind of smooth region has many fewer impact sites. A couple big ones, but mostly smooth. Well, let's take that idea and extend it down to one of Pluto's most distinctive features. Right over here, the heart of Pluto. This is, I believe, the Sputnik planation. When you're looking at this, 
and the Tomba Regio, I think. Those are names of this area. When you're looking around here, you can see a relatively smooth surface. It's a little bumpy. It's got these kind of rifts or cracks in it, but no craters. And that's telling us that this is a very smooth surface. This is a very young surface, so much so that it's one of the most active regions in our solar system. There's a lot of action happening going on Pluto. It is a wonderfully moving place. And that really means that there's an opportunity for change on the surface. Do we think there's life there? Probably not. But there's enough going on on Pluto that I wish we had another mission already on the way. And alas, it's going to be a long time before we return there. Before we go away, though, these are some of my favorite features. These super spiky, super tall mountains are something called the penitents or the dragon's teeth. They are ultra sharp mountains, almost like blades of ice. Very similar to the penitents or dragon's teeth we see forming at high altitude snowpack here on planet Earth. That's where the ice itself undergoes the process of sublimation, going straight from a solid to a gas when it becomes energetic. So those are mountains actually being sculpted by the sun rather than sculpted by collisions. Sounds like Leon wants to know, can I click the blue circles? I can absolutely try. Nothing happens. The blue circles are our indicators for our exoplanets that I forgot to turn off. But an important rule of being a planetarium pilot is never leave information up that you're not talking about. And I just broke that rule. But with that... I think we are getting pretty close. Terry wants to know how many asteroids have impacted Earth? A whole bunch. I wish I could be more specific than that, but it really depends on how big an impact we're talking. There's a tool I believe I saw a couple days ago. I will try and link in here to see if there are any nearby impacts to where you live on planet Earth, which is always kind of a cool thing to do. Perhaps one of our most iconic impact sites here in the US is Meteor Crater. So if any of you have been through Arizona and seen that gigantic impact site, it is really cool. And if you want to see it up close and personal, check out our show Incoming, where we start off by flying around that beautiful location. So I'm going to take us back towards planet Earth. Uh, on the way, Daniel wants to know, do all of our planets rotate on an axis like Earth? Some of them do very slowly. Some of them go very quickly. But all of them have some kind of rotation to match their revolution. Now, that's a cool thing. It would be very tough for a planet to have a completely still object out there. It might exist. There's a lot of planets out there, but it all depends on your frame of reference because you have to be orbiting a star for you to be stable or else you would just fall into the star or you're flying away from the star. And if you are orbiting a star, I would say given the star's frame of reference, you would be spinning as it were, or you would not be spinning, in which case by your own frame of reference, you'd be spinning. But in the universe, motion is a constant and physicists get real sneaky about defining frames of reference. So I would say no matter what, you could define a frame of reference where any world is moving. And with that somewhat circuitous, kind of wacky answer, I apologize for that. I would like to thank all of you for tuning in. If you are interested in open space, by all means, download it and check it out for yourself. It is a wonderful, very fun program. And I personally am about to jump to version 0 0.16. I recommend you do the same. And that will mean asteroids next week, along with a whole bunch of other really cool stuff. Tune in this Friday for another open space program where we're going to be talking about the cool stuff we can see on Mars and some of the analogs here on planet Earth. But on behalf of myself, my producer, Mary Morrison, Planetarium and Open Space, thank you all for tuning in and have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday.